Welcome to Breaking Down the Bergman. I'm David Friend. And I'm Sonia Strimban. And we are looking at all these women. What are you doing here? For what are you doing? I wrote most of the biography. Yes, I did not. Have you met Felix? He has not yet managed to get a hold of me. I have sent him my composition. Som jag har tillägnat honom. Jag hade tänkt att han skulle uppföra den. Vi är ur uppföra den på sin stora radiokonsert. I så fall skjuter jag honom. <laughs> Mästaren försvann just med sin hustru. Diskussion heter sak. Jag heter Adelaide. Cornelius. Jag är Felix hustru. Aj, 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 aj. Ja. Ja, 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 ja. En härlig kvinna. Ja. David and I have decided to pay a sensational tribute to Bergman's sensational comedy, All These Women. <laughs> we had a lot of fun watching it. Yeah, we did. I think most audiences would have a lot of fun watching it, and I'm pretty sure that the director and the cast had a blast making it. Yeah, there's a lot of backstory to this film in the sense that I think this is just as much about Bergman as many of his other movies are, even though it has this silly front. The movie starts with a little warning on the screen that says that the film is not based on anyone existing in reality. Huge lie. It's all about Bergman. <laughs> it's gotta be, right? Of course it's a lie. I mean, at the center of the film, we have a character which is a parody of Bergman himself. And that is a virtuoso cellist who is a master of his art and has all of these people fawning over him. And particularly, an entire harem of women. And they're all waiting for artists to appear. And then we have the critic, a bumbling buffoon who can't seem to get his context right, can't seem to respect the art because he might trip over it, literally, and uh, a, little, a little obsessed in the, all the wrong ways. Yeah, he's just very pompous and disingenuous and he, with a false intellect and a lot of airs and just a ludicrous, ludicrous character, which is, I think, exactly what Bergman thought of most of his critics. So let's talk about the color of this film, because it is the first color Bergman film, and it's splashed with lavish shades of everything, and there's really no no seeming rhyme or reason for any of it. His use of color in this movie is as much of an indictment as just basically any other element. I think Bergman is making fun of the fact that so many other filmmakers and directors and producers have jumped on the color bandwagon. And the palette in this um, film is absolutely hilarious. I mean, it's so over the top and sensational that it makes no sense in real life. No, and I think that the people that he worked with on this film, both on the screen and off, were in on this joke, if we want to call it that, as a film. Erlen Josephson co-wrote it. He's worked with Bergman before. The women on the screen, all stars, um, or almost all stars of Bergman films past. And lovers. And lovers. A key <laughs> element, and you know, maybe that's what I want to talk about here first, is the fact that I was just shocked that so many of these women said yes to Bergman, I'm going to star in all these women. Because they kind of come off as foolish, to put it lightly. Jealous, petty, bimbos, desperate for attention and love. Yeah. Obsessed. <laughs> it's certainly questionable. I think really we're not supposed to take the film seriously. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to take any of his kind of finger pointing overly seriously. Mm -hmm. It's a spoof. 
you know, and each of these women in a way, like you have to have a lot of character to be able to laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. And they're laughing at themselves, they're laughing at their infatuation with him and the weird triangled love affairs that probably some of them have shared. Bergman, obviously at this point in his career was so well established and so well trusted by these ladies that he could basically do whatever he wanted and they'd still be in his movie. <laughs> Är du sjunger? Obekymrad av att du avlyssnas av en sträng kritiker? <laughs> Så? <laughs> Har till och med du respekt för vad jag skriver? Mm? Jarl Kuli, who we saw in Devil's Eye, sort of reprises that role in some respects here as the critic. The critic and the seducer of all of the maestro's women. Yeah, it's a role that we've seen him play in Bergman's films before. Mm. Also in Smiles of a Summer Night, which was a similar kind of uh, macho bravado type of masculine role where he's trying to be a seducer. But in this movie, of course, it's all ludicrous. And at one point, we actually see him in drag, which I think is a great twist. He looks like he's having fun. They all look like they're having fun. We can label this a comedy, and it can be added to that very short list of Bergman comedies, but I think that we can say at this point, Bergman isn't a master of comedy. No, it's not his forte. But I don't think this film was supposed to necessarily exemplify a strength of his. What's nice about this film, and similar to some of the other comedies that he's done, is this real kind of homage that he pays to a lot of different comedic genres. I mean, we've got everything in his brother in this film. Mm. You've got slapstick, you've mm. got drag, you've got like the British style weird thing that they do where everybody runs after each other to a funny music. Um, you've got more of like the silent era film. There's just about everything mixed in. And on the one hand, it just looks like a, like a weird pastiche of ha-ha-has, but it kind of works. Okay, so we've celebrated all of these wonderful things about all these women, but what about what doesn't work with it? Because, to be honest, it's not a perfect film. I don't imagine that Svensk would give him a huge budget for something like this. Well, the way that it worked is that he did this for Svensk so that Svensk could, you know, get a little bit more cash because oh, he made all these art films and, you know, it was time for him to help them out a little bit. Really? I can just... How would the pitch for that movie even go? Can you imagine that? I have no idea. <laughs> I can't even start. Maybe it started with costumes. Maybe he came in dressed up. Maybe he just came in and said, <laughs> guys, I'm going to do this in color. And they were just like, sold. I think that they actually wanted the color film because at this point color was the commercial way to, to market movies. Bergman, of course, had worked in, only in black and white and you know he returns to black and white with his next film, Persona. Um, but it doesn't really work. I don't think the color palette of this film is particularly no, fantastic. No, he didn't take it seriously. He uses color as a form of costuming, you know, as, as a form of mockery in a way. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the women are all dressed in very specific type of outfits. He coordinates the color of the set with the color of the clothes that people are wearing. I'm thinking in particular of the one scene where everyone gathers to hear the master play and everyone is wearing shades of black, white, and red. And they're all sitting together in this tableau-like environment. It's just, it's all very staged and unnatural. It's just kind of funny. But the lack of proper use of color kind of adds to that don't take it seriously type approach that this movie seems to take. But you know, I have trouble taking it entirely as a joke because Bergman just can't get away from saying something. So what do you think this movie's saying to us? Well, there's that real question that exists at the end when the women look for someone to replace the dead cellist who we can theorize might be Bergman. Um, what is Bourbon trying to say when they all turn to another artist as their leader? I think it just shows the cynicism of this director. 
Yeah, I think he's very frustrated with how the art world works. You know, it's, it's, he's just exposing the formula of what it is to be great and questioning if great people really are great, if they're just so easily replaced. So, Son, in all seriousness, is this essential Bergman? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, um, no, oh, and neither is this episode, by the way. <laughs> but it's fun, right? Why doesn't it make it essential? I suppose if you really wanted to know Bergman, including his dark side and his lighthearted side, then yes, it would be essential, because I think of any of his comedies, this is the most revealing about just the honest, true Bergman as a person. It works as one of those films that if you want a little bit of a break... <laughs> If you want a little bit of a break from Bergman um, and his heaviness, no, it's not essential. Though it is important, it is his first color film because he will make more color movies, so. And hopefully, that are done better. <laughs> and uh, I guess that brings us to the end of this episode of Breaking Down oh Bergman. <laughs> I'm sure you feel the same way. Um, be sure to join us next time. We're looking at a much more serious film, Persona. I know that a lot of you have been looking forward to it because you've commented on our pages and we welcome you and your feedback, maybe not about this episode, but some of our later ones. <laughs> and until then, if you still take it seriously, subscribe to the channel. And uh, we hope to see you next time.